Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ruth Johnson, and I'm the City Archaeologist with Dublin City Council. I'm here to introduce you to the conservation management plan that is underway for St. Canis's Church and Graveyard in Finglas. Um, I'm representing a small steering group in Dublin City Council from the um, Archaeology Office, the Parks Department and the Area Office. Um, we also have a, a project team led by John Tierney of Octra Archaeology and Fergal McNamara 7L Architects. But we also have a number of sub consultants working on the project. Community Monuments funding in April 2021. And we received notification from the department in June that we had full funding for Stream 2. And the idea behind the plan is that we will work on, build on work um, that we've carried out previously in 2011, when we carried out a laser survey of the High Cross. 2012, when we worked with Octra to um, undertake a community um, graveyards roadshow on the site and subsequently in the archaeology section of Dublin City Council to prepare a conservation plan for the site. Prior to 2021, the most recent piece of work that we undertook at the graveyard was to carry out a condition survey of the High Cross, and this work was undertaken by Carrick Conservation, uh, geologist George Sevastopoulou of Trinity College Dublin. Um, and I'm very sad to say that George um, passed away on Friday, and we'd like to just take the opportunity to give our... Um, thoughts and best wishes to his family at this sad time. The project as we're carrying it out in 2021 is primarily research based. So um, the intention is to gather information about the site and understand the monument in three dimensions um, in terms of its heritage, its cultural significance and its condition. And hopefully then we'll be able to use this plan on which to base future um, funding applications for conservation works, targeted conservation works, for instance, to the church and to the mortuary memorials. The announcement of the funding from the department, we've had fantastic interest from local elected representatives and from the local community. And in order then to um, provide them with information, we have carried out two information sessions in the last fortnight. Um, one with the local elected representatives and another with um, local interest groups. And um, that has been a really informative part of the process and hopefully will continue as the project progresses. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, and that is um, John Tierney. Hi, this is John Tierney and we're uh here to do a talk about the um, historic graveyard of St. Canis's in Finglas. And as part of doing a uh, conservation management plan, the first thing you've got to do is understand the place. And if you're going to understand Finglas, I think this is a good place to start on this pedestrian um, walkover bridge. This bridge is actually, even though it's modern and brutal, it's, a, it's actually the old line. It follows a line potentially of one of the medieval um, uh, roads. That's Church uh, Street over there. Potentially that curving line is uh, an early monastic, uh, following an early monastic curving line as well. Potentially an enclosure. And um, high ground over there, high ground over here uh, where the village is. And one hypothesis we have is that the early monastic site actually surrounded this whole area here. Uh, going up as far as the, the motor, the, the bridge up abo above. Uh, Finglas, we all around the country know Finglas because of the place name, the, the water on Fionglas, uh, the clear water, the stream of the clear water. And the, the Finglas stream is under us down here. It was culverted and covered by this bypass. Keep these places in mind as we, as we go to understand the, um, the graveyard. Talking to the local community during the week it's a village it's a town it has its own identity and the identity is tied up with this place that we're here to study now that's the ruined church and there's the graveyard proper out beyond I'm here now at one of the entrance gates for the graveyard um, and I think it's an interesting vantage point we're here on Church Street that lovely curving sweep that's telling us something the ground is sloping down here. This was a weed lane. 
sides of the glen running up there. The bypass, dual carriageway, whatever you call it, is actually following the glen. And then the ground rises up over yonder as well. Um, so we have two hypotheses about the enclosure. The ecclesiastical enclosure, one, it was very big and potentially it was D-shaped, forming a D onto the stream down here on Fionglash. Or the Finglas stream was in the middle and that the enclosure um, uh, uh, was well beyond us up here, cut in across by the Lee Mellows um, Park, the entrance there, and came across and surrounded everything we're looking at over there. That's the second hypothesis. The conservation management plan is about understanding the place. Understanding the place, understanding the place, in this case the graveyard is about to do that, you have to understand the parish, the town, the village, and the streetscape. And most people who know, most people who travel in and out of Dublin along this road, they'll know Finglas by that pedestrian walkway. Um, and I just think it's so interesting that it's potentially retaining the sweep of a medieval monastic enclosure. Uh, potentially, is anyway. Uh, uh, so this is an important view for this part of the graveyard. If that is the sweep, the outer sweep of a medieval monastic enclosure, that means this graveyard is outside that sweep. So this graveyard is potentially a satellite within a larger monastic complex, perhaps. That's a possibility. And another important view then for what that wider monastic um, enclosure might be is down at the other end of the graveyard, so we'll head down there now. So this is the other gate, the main gate. He was nowadays here into St. Canis's graveyard. And it opens, it's, it's reached uh, here through Barrack Lane. Uh, the barracks was just to the right beyond us here now, now gone. And one scenario is that this is the outer boundary then of this larger monastic enclosure. Again, it might just go as far as the stream, which is down there in the central um, aisle somewhere. Uh, uh, or it might have continued over across uh, uh, to the other side, over to the Ballygall uh, Road. And um, so that this is an important location. The other reason this is an important location is because the nether cross is here. This high cross, um, which was dug up and re-erected here by the Reverend Walsh. Um, and I think its location is very important. It stands here and if we face out, where does it look? It looks straight across over there. Uh, modern building in the way. Um, when the High Cross was buried, um, apparently to avoid uh, Cromwell and his um, uh, army's depredations, um, it was reported to have been found and dug up in the Glebe Fields. Now, the area over there, where I'm pointing, uh, is one area called the Glebe Fields. So is it possible that the Reverend um, Walsh pointed her over this way because she was facing the village and maybe even facing where she actually originally stood. That's one possibility we're exploring right now. We have no answers, we just have questions at present. Uh, also the case here with the High Cross. It's very interesting to visit her and see that there's all, there's constantly this dust or dandruff, somebody called it, falling somehow from this High Cross. And part, one of the reasons for the management, conservation management plan is to assess, is to measure and assess, is the cross degrading? Is it in danger of um, being affected by climate change and um, the, all the adjacent traffic and things? We have no answers now. Uh, we're taking detailed measurements. The Faro uh, uh, 3D survey is being compared with two previous surveys commissioned by Dublin City Council. And that's how we're exploring this. She's so top heavy, but what we found is that she's facing east and she was positioned here maybe to, to face where she was found but also to, 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 to face the rising sun which was the practice here in these graveyards. We bury our people facing the rising sun. The relationship between the, the sun is in persona Christi. Um, it's not sun worship, it's the worship of Christ in the Christian faith uh, that represents the sighting of this cross here and uh, of a lot of these headstones. And I'll go into that now. So, if we bury our people facing east, um, that means, and if we reuse our family graves, then that means graveyards become highly organised spaces. And as part of the con uh, conservation management plan, we're analysing how organised this, this graveyard is. What we've done is we've numbered uh, all the mortuary monuments, they all 
a little tag here and a number on. We've uh, recorded names and dates and uh, we're basically working out how these mortuary monuments, um, uh, how, uh, what decade they were erected. We ascribe a decade of erection. And then we analyse the distribution of the headstones um, by decade. Ooh, uh, community graveyard surveys all over Ireland. And I've been doing them for the last 10 years. Very often we'll get uh, early groups. When I say early, you now headstones that date 1740s, 1780s. Um, we'll usually get an early group just south of the church. And then we'll also usually get another group east of the church. But what's been um, so interesting about here in uh, uh, St. Canis's is that, in fact, one of our early groups is here to the south east. And then we have another early group right in the south corner. And that was just perplexing us for a while. Um, but we think we have uh, a solution uh, or an answer for that. It's based on politics. Uh, graveyards very often are about politics and about uh, arm wrestles in society. Uh, the, the, the gate over there uh, was reputedly used by members of the Protestant faith. The gate down here in this corner was used by members of the Catholic faith. Um, so you can see straight away by the story alone that there was an arm wrestle between the different branches of Catholicism, or sorry, Christianity. Um, and then within the graveyard too, the headstones are all about status. And this is a big high status burial. Um, it's for an English chap called Polkington um, and it's his date of death was 1732. If we ascribe his, this monument to the 1730s, it's very early uh, for uh, a, a chest tomb like this. Um, so we're not sure exactly when, but I'd be happy to say that it was close to the 1730s, 1740s, 1750s. And it's, uh, it would have been, uh, there's a great big substructure under there. Uh, a vault probably and iron rails and things like that um, and it's a political uh, statement uh, uh, on the ground um, if you look back over there looking through there there's a blocked up doorway in the church right there and our thinking is is that um, the graveyard was organized somewhat different to what it is today that these yew trees that we can see here on the left there's one there and there's one there are planted and they were deliberately planted to form an outer uh, avenue here and this is the outer this is the uh, um, uh, southern avenue here leading down to Polkington's grave and I think very deliberately designed as an arm wrestle a political arm wrestle and then another avenue is running down here towards the gate um, although we're not sure uh, if the gate coincided with the design of this avenue uh, how, how long that gate is there um, what we have is a planned garden, planned, planted garden, preserved by the yew trees. We have a, a tree specialist looking at them and I was concerned to say what ages are they but the tree specialist told us look at the line um, they're, they're, they're forming an avenue which I think is very interesting. Now the avenues have been filled up by graves since so whatever politics was going on with Polkington and Co uh, uh, it was like Ozymandias like uh, people didn't care after a while. To understand the place we we look in detail at the burial patterns and through that we read the headstones and just this fella is leaning out forward um, and just to show you what we're seeing and how we do it we, we read the headstones with a torch um, uh, 300 lumens are stronger in strength and we shine the torch across the face of the stone and that gives us um, that picks out shadows and that allows us to read it do you remember I said about the sun um, that the high cross is facing across to the sun catch the morning sun because the sun is in persona Christi. Here's the sun again. IHS is the Christogram. It's, it represents Christ. The cross attached to the IHS. And then uh, you can see uh, this uh, uh, the sun um, rays around outside as well. All very ancient iconography, all still in use here in this early 19th century grave. And then we read it and we look for the coded messages that are in it that will help us work out um, who it is. This stone was erected by Hannah Barden and her husband Patrick Barden who departed this life December 1815 age 35. So we read all them using the torch we fill out a database and in this case um, with Dumb City Council and local schools we survey the graveyard and local heritage groups um, we survey this graveyard and we put them all online on the Hysteric Graves website.
and we do this with every single one trying to capture as much information as we can and as well as that then um, you can see this technique we have for shining the light across the face of the stone we also do that digitally with the graveyard look at the shape of the ground here we've surveyed the shape of the ground using uh, a drone um, uh, mounted camera and we've produced a model of the graveyard floor and you can see this grave here it dips down it has a gravestone over here there's another dip but there's no gravestone so we analyze the shape of the ground to find out where people are buried and we also use the grave monuments to find out where people are buried and using that technique we're, we're exploring the place we're trying to understand it um, you can see some of the grave monuments are leaning we don't mind tilting we don't mind um, but if they're burst apart uh, and they need some TLC then one of the aims of the project is to identify them, um, uh, evaluate them and make recommendations for their care. Well, my name is Fergal McNamara um, from 7L Architects. I'm a conservation architect and we were, we're looking at the, the conservation issues and I suppose issues around repair of you know, the church, the memorials and the boundary wall and of course the, the high cross. Um, so one of the, the main um, methodologies we use actually um, is the, the conservation of the, the mortuary memorials in the graveyard, which is quite a challenge because there'd be over 300 separate memorials. So we would have spent time going, uh, following John around the graveyard, as it were, when he does his inventory, we follow along and review each uh, mortuary monument in turn and uh, assess its condition and decide what the methodology might be for its repair. And then we group those into uh, using a traffic light format into kind of red, which is sort of complex or urgent repairs, yellow, which is sort of middle of the road, but also requiring um, repairs by specialist. And then green are repairs that would might be just done as part of the maintenance strategy or even by volunteers. About half of the memorials needed some intervention but only about 16 of them needed complex repairs and then about 40 uh, needed um, you know, less complex repairs. So that can be kind of phased over time and also monitored as they go along. Um, and then another uh, aspect of it that we spent a lot of time looking at was the, the condition of the church. Um, so it's a multi-phase church, you know, dating from the medieval period. Um, so you could see the different phases and they're important to try and understand how I suppose the building is put together and um, where the, there's issues at the different interfaces between the phases. And also to give a, a suppose an understanding and a presentation to the community about a more nuanced understanding of, of the church and how it, how it evolved over time along with the, um, with the graveyard. Um, and there we found that most of the areas of concern related to those parts of the church that were stabilized, say probably in the, in the mid 20th century where they're using hard cement mortars to cap the top of the walls, to repoint window jams, uh, to infill openings, to install grills and gates that have rusted. So our priorities appear to be just reversing some of that, um, those interventions, because overall the, the church is at, at rest, except for those areas where there's vegetation encroachment also. So our priority in 2022 would be to address the condition of the chancel where we can see that hard cement mortars have started to cause decay to the, um, the window jams, some of the lovely sandstone um, OG windows that have survived. A particular feature of Fingless Church is its wall plaster. A considerable amount has survived um, since it was you know, made roof, roofless in the mid 19th century um, and appears to be, the degradation of the plaster appears to be accelerating because the amount of plaster you find on the ground today suggests that it's falling off the walls now more than it has been uh, up to now in order to get to the state that it's in. An uh, aspect of it, I suppose they're addressing immediately would be the high cross. And that's, um, John would have taken you through um, the works there, but obviously it, at this stage, I suppose all we can say is, we can see that the, the high cross has, retains a visual appearance that it had the late, in, late 19th century from the, the historic photographs. But yet when you put your hand on the high cross, you can dislodge tiny grains of granite and you can see little grains of granite that, you know, at its base. So it is of concern, but we just looking at the data now decide 
if we have to do anything, um, what I suppose sensible, straightforward things we can do to improve its situation and trying to understand whether there is a, a rate of decay there that we need to be concerned about. And then the, la the very last aspect, sorry, would be the boundary walls. Uh, obviously, the, the, the setting of the, the graveyard has changed a lot in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, and as part of the, um, the, the boundary wall had to be rebuilt there in, in the last 20 years. But it's obviously been encroached by ivy as well. Um, that's something that, that needs to be managed. And also it has, I suppose, been enclosed by new roads and new development. And you find this encroachment on the, a lot of the urban graveyards is a consideration. There's a lot to talk about when you're in a graveyard like this. And when you do the conservation management plan, you have to cover things in a lot of detail, but you also have to capture the big picture. One of the main parts of the study besides the burial patterns, uh, dealing with the conservation challenges with the High Cross, there's also the conservation challenges with the ruined church. And a big part of what we're doing has been to record the church. So we record it using photogrammetry, which is a technique for taking multiple photographs and making a digital model. And um, uh, we also have uh, a team, an architect and an archeologist who are specialists in recording the buildings, looking at the building, looking for traces of older elements and seeing can they work out how the church developed through time and what they can see are things like this window here you see this window it's got the iron rails stuck in sometime in the last 30 40 years there's brick in the corner this is a later expanded uh, window but then an earlier medieval window survives here and traces like that so the team are looking at those kind of things as well and when we're doing this we live in maps we live in historic documents we have a historian um, who's, look at, who's looked at the historic documents, uh, Dr. Paul McCotter. One of the things that strikes me, looking at property maps, is that this curving wall uh, is very interesting. This curving wall is the closest one to Church Street. It could be a trace. Uh, there could be uh, an ecclesiastical medieval uh, enclosure over there, um, over towards the Church of Ireland and the ramparts behind them. And then maybe if this is a satellite church this wee wall here might be maintaining some early original line that then ultimately was expanded outwards so the side aisle here oh yeah the other thing i was going to say is here look at the granite why is there granite here in, in this um, uh, gable uh, 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 is it potentially coming from an earlier church an earlier monastic church uh, rather than this uh, later medieval one. So there's loads going on. There's lots to consider. A lot of the story is under the ground. Here's that blocked up doorway that I was talking about. Here's the U Avenue leading down to Polkington's grave. And then here in the 20th century is where we bury our people out into the body of the graveyard. So it's a team based project. We're halfway through the project now. Um, Paul Nissens is doing the drone survey. Um, Dave Pollock is doing the um, um, building phasing along with Fergal McNamara, the conservation uh, architect. And uh, Dr. Paul McCotter is doing the uh, historicals. And um, John Manili, who's a geologist, is doing the measured survey for us of the, um, the High Cross and he's comparing it with the earlier models. Uh, thanks um, Simon Dowling, uh, who made one of the earlier models. Thanks to him for passing it on to us. So we're halfway through, we've another while to go and um, it's a fascinating process trying to look after this place as best we can um, when there's resources being made available through the uh, Community Monument Fund. Um, the whole project has been organised and uh, project managed by the city archaeologist Ruth Johnson and uh, her colleague Christina Todd are uh, keeping the whole thing rolling along. For me as a person who didn't know Fingless very well. It's been a fascinating project. It's been a chance to get to grips with the um, potentially early monastic uh, landscape of Fingless. And uh, uh, there's a lot more to address here uh, in this lovely place. I hope you've got some sense of what we're doing anyway as part of this um, Community Monument Fund uh, Conservation Management Plan. Uh, we've consulted with the community and we'll continue to consult with the community. Uh, thanks to the Lynch family for helping us over the last couple of months in the various ways that they have. Slanish.